Nice, thank you so much. So we are the Human Society of Greater Phoenix, your secular oasis here in the valley. Thanks so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. It's always good to see everybody again. Um, I am your president and host, Chris Wojno. Our vice president is Alex in the back. He's our vice president. Um, so today's events and this building is brought to you by you, our generous donors and members. If you're not a member yet, please consider becoming a member. Your ongoing support really helps us achieve our mission and keep this place going. And we thank you for all you do. How was breakfast? Good. Let's thank the breakfast crew. Thanks. Awesome, awesome. Uh, anybody here for the very first time? Raise your hand. Any new men? New people? <laughs> Cheaters. All right. Anyway, uh, so thank you for being here. It's awesome to see you. Uh, does anybody have a cell phone? Anybody have a cell phone? Please silence that cell phone. Nobody has a cell phone. Thank you for your silence. So we have a couple of announcements. I'd like to bring Richard up for our first. Well, now that we know that you like breakfast, let's talk about lunch. <laughs> so, no, every, uh, every Sunday morning meeting and, and, and uh, for other meetings, we do have a lunch crowd going out to a restaurant around the corner, and we have reservations at noon, and it is important for people to understand you don't actually have to have any food there. You can actually have a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea or something like that, but it's really good for us to just sit and socialize and just have some chatting and talk about whatever crazy things that humanists come up and talk about. Um, so anyway, it's the Mesa Community Restaurant. It's over on Country Club, just a couple blocks away, and I can give you directions after the meeting. Just come up and find me right after the meeting, and I'll tell you uh, where it is. And just so you know, our speaker today is joining us for lunch. So if you want to um, pound her with more questions about Arizona education, <laughs> you can do that at lunch. Um, so please consider coming, especially new people. Does any new people here? Yeah, okay, so um, please consider coming to lunch. And uh, we do have a lot of fun there. When we, when we go to lunch, uh, we do have our own back room. There's a reason for that because we often get into conversations the rest of the restaurant do not want to hear about no, uh, because not. that's the kind of people that we are. And um, we have our own waitress who actually puts up with us. And so we do have a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. So please consider coming to lunch. Thanks, Richard. Hope to see you at lunch. I'll try to be there too. Um, any Instagram savvy folks here? Anybody who uses Instagram? Uh, any, anybody who's handy? Anybody who does handy work on the side? <laughs> I know it's early, but come on. Uh, all right, just, 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 just trying to put a poll out there. Um, anybody ready for the Flying Spaghetti Monster dinner next weekend? Yeah. Who here is going? Who here is dressing up? <laughs> nice, all right. So if you do dress up, you get to win one of two fine bottles of plantation rum, which I will be donating to the party. Uh, if you dress like a pirate and you win the contest as best dressed pirate, that bottle of rum will be yours. If you talk like a pirate and win the contest of talking best like a pirate, that bottle of rum will be yours. So please do come. We do need more prizes though. Uh, if you anybody want to bring in some gift cards, anybody want to? Because I know Roxanne's bringing in gift cards. Yeah. Um, I just put some movie tickets in the room there. Movie tickets are great. Chris, Kathy wants to talk. We've gotten several donations today. We had tickets to the MIM, the oh, Botanical nice. Garden, mm -hmm. to the Boys Ar uh, Pumpkin Arboretum. Uh, we have um, the Punch a Can game where you're going to get gold and silver and pieces of eight. And uh, we have hand drums. African drum and a xylophone. Uh, really nice ones. Really, really nice ones. Ones that I hope I get to, take, to give to my four year old great grandson to take home with me. <laughs> yeah. So we have some really nice prizes. There's some jewelry that were made by uh, some friends of a member, and uh, it's looking nice. Yeah, awesome. So we are going to have a whole bunch of games, and you get to win some of those nice prizes. Is there a question? So yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We are, of course, having spaghetti. 
Uh, for our volunteers, we're going to start setting this place up at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you have time to come help us set up, there's a lot of work to do. So we could use an extra set of hands, you know, if you're handy. <laughs> uh, anyways. Send, I, I have a list of people who had signed up to volunteer, and I'm going to email them. Okay. If um, anybody else wants to volunteer, that's fine, too. Oh, yeah. It's going to be amazing. And then, so doors are going to open at 6 o'clock. Uh, so we hope to see you there. We'll have the hoisting of the flag. We're going to have our Flying Spaghetti Monster singers. We've got the games. We've got the children that are coming in. They're going to teach us about the origins of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have a great time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. You can buy your tickets online at hsgb.org or you can buy them at the door. So please do, uh, please do come and p please bring prizes. You can always bring them last minute. We would love to help give those away. And it is a fundraiser, so we're going to have a lot of fun and raise a lot of money for our center. And, you know, it helps us keep going and make sure that we're continuing on our mission and able to do what we, you know, need to do to get our name out there, right? Spread the message. Uh, speaking of which, uh, we're, so this is uh, some serious news. I'm going to set my tablet down. <clears throat> uh, we are thinking about doing, uh, getting professionalized here. And that means we're considering hiring somebody full-time to work for the Human Society of Greater Phoenix to help us achieve our mission goals, which is to get our name out there. There are a lot of people out there that go to church, they sit in the pews, and they don't know we exist. They don't know that this is a thing that they can go to as an alternative. And there's a lot more services and things that we could be offering to people who are stuck and don't have anywhere else to go, and we just we don't have the bandwidth, we don't have the time. So we're thinking about hiring somebody, and uh, the board is on board. <laughs> The board is engaged. <laughs> uh, we've had two town halls so far, town halls so far to discuss this question, and they've been largely positive. And we're going to have a vote on this at the next Sunday speaker meeting on the 23rd. I will probably email email out some, you know, like a, a Google form or something in case you can't make it. But we'd love to have you there. Uh, share, spread the word. I'll probably put out an announcement in our meeting announcement on the side in the, in the mailing. Uh, to come out and vote on this very important question. If we're a go for this, the board's ready to go. And we're gonna start our fundraising campaign to raise $25,000 by the end of the year to pay for half of that salary for next year. So the, the goal is gonna be hire somebody. The job description's on the website on, on our meetup stuff. If you need the link, we can post it as well. Uh, go ahead and read it. Let us know what you think. If we need to add anything, remove anything, change anything. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna hire somebody for next year, ideally, uh, for $50,000 a year to help us move forward and to really push humanism wider to the greater world and really make a difference in our local community and in the lives of people. Yeah. Any questions or comments on that? Oh, yeah, I've gotta do the town halls early in the morning next time. <laughs> <laughs> on a rainy day. Uh, okay, so I'd like to uh, bring up Pam for our Humanist Minute. Thank you. So we have a couple of things. That, first of all, Anita doesn't know I'm doing this. I wanted to um, to share this with you. I don't know if any of you, did you see the statues on the table, the, the food table back there? So Jennifer um, created this one that she donated to us, and it's in the library. So a big hand of Round of applause for Jennifer to say thank you. And the other three are for sale, so if you're interested in purchasing one of them, please talk to Jennifer about that. Okay, and, and the other thing is Anita and I are um, the nominations committee for the new board for next year. So um, if any of you are interested in taking on one of the board positions, we want you to come up and talk to us about it. We'll give you information about the board, we're going to be having some forms and information for you so that you can have a job description, you can read about them, and you can also fill out something if you're interested. So please let us know if you're interested. We do vote on the board positions when? The second meeting in November. The second meeting in November, so we need to hear from you soon. And I, I think the form will be mailed out. Email. email? Email. Okay, yeah. So we'll get that all prepared and it'll be emailed out to the membership. Um, I just wanted to tell you what the positions are. Um, I 
Okay, we have a president, we have vice president, we have a treasurer. Oh yes, treasurer is very, very important. Our current treasurer, Chris Appleton, uh, will be uh, vacating the position in about March or April of next year. We need somebody with accounting experience. This is a key position on our board. Uh, this person takes care of all the monies, uh, makes up the, uh, the data for, what do you call those? Budgets. Spreadsheets. Budgets. Budget. Um, we cannot run without a treasurer, without a dedicated person to uh, tally the numbers. So if anybody's interested, um, just let us know and we'll be sending out the form shortly. So that's treasurer. Uh, we have secretary. Uh, we have uh, program director, property director, membership director. I think there's one more. Mem uh, we're two members at large. Yeah. One is a fundraiser, the other one is what? Any communications. And communications. Okay. That's it. Yeah, so let us know if you have any questions. So we're anxious to create a great board for next year. Yay. Okay, so that was a little bit of business for our humanist minute this time. Uh, if you are interested in running for the board, uh, you know, please do throw your hat in the ring and love to see what ideas you want to come up with and we do need some other assistance if you don't want the full responsibility of a, of a board membership uh, you know we do need help for you know a, a lot of other things so if you do have some time we'd love to have you there um, just quick question before does anybody have accounting experience <laughs> anyone willing to admit they have to bit, yeah. uh, Howard a bit, Howard a bit. Yeah. Okay, do you have anybody you're willing to sell out that has accounting experience? There's got to be more hands there. Anyway, uh, right? Howard's running for everything. Um, anyway, if you do know a friend you think that we could use their help, please send them our name, and uh, if you send it to Pam or Anita, uh, we'll get them, you know, we'll talk to them and twist their arm. So, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Uh, the board meetings, you do get a, a real chance to, you know, have a say and change the direction of the way this, this place is run and, and what gets done and what activities we do. So it's not just work, it's actually, you know, being a guiding hand in humanism in Phoenix for sure and possibly Arizona in the, in the near short future. Okay, so that's my spiel for the uh, Humanist Minute. Pam, would you like to come up and introduce our speaker? <laughs> Welcome back to the stage. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we're, I'm really excited about our, our speaker today, Sarah Richardson. I mean, Joe gave us a great talk comparing our education system to the Massachusetts uh, education system, which was upsetting, but very important, and education the importance of education has not gone away, even though you know it may be out of the news or in the news a little bit less. So we're really excited to have Sarah come and talk to us. So let me tell you a little bit about Sarah. Sarah was born and raised in Arizona, where she attended public schools in Tempe and Chandler and graduated twice from Arizona State University. She has a bachelor's in business administration with a minor in French and a certificate of international business. She also has a master's degree in education. Sarah is married to Mark Richardson, the executive director of the Arizona Academy of the Performing Arts, and has three children who are now 10, seven, and six. Sorry. Sarah currently is an adjunct business professor for Northern Arizona University and the state education outreach director for Save Our Schools Arizona. She volunteers as a lead presenter with AZ Ed 101 to fulfill her passion for education advocacy. So please help me welcome Sarah Richardson. Hello everyone, thanks for having me. Everyone can hear, right? This works yeah. well? Yeah. All right, um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about ACI 101 before we get started, um, how this came about. So ACI 101, we're just a group of volunteers around our kitchen table. We all met in the spring of 2017 
A bunch of us started hanging out at the state capitol. Don't ask me why. <laughs> we just started to get involved and you know, then kind of, hey, I saw you here last week, or I saw you here last week, and we all kind of became friends. And as we're watching what's happening on the floor of the legislature, we're you know, wondering, you know, we knew what things about education were not doing well in Arizona. We knew things were kind of bad. We didn't know how bad they were. We didn't know how we got there. And so we had a lot of questions. And while there is a lot of amazing organizations around Arizona who provide information about what's going on, we couldn't find all of our answers kind of in one place. So we thought, let's put together this presentation and share it with as many people as we can. So we did the research and we joke now that we're kind of a positive multi-level marketing company. Um, we're grassroots. We go around giving this presentation to any kind of group. We do house parties where you know, people have cheese and wine and we just kind of talk about stuff all the way up to really large conventions, school groups, you know, anything, church <laughs> congregations, um, anything you can think of. And then what we do is ask that you spread this message with all your friends, whether you <coughs> become, we train you to become a presenter or you just simply share some facts. Um, and we've presented now all over the state of Arizona. We have presenters all the way from Kingman to Yuma, Flagstaff, Sholo, Tucson, Phoenix. So we have a lot of people trying to spread the word. And we think it's really important just to have facts. So obviously education has become really um, big in the news and just really emotional right now for Arizona voters. And I think having the facts behind it's really important. Another thing that was important to us when we did this presentation is that we didn't want it to become a partisan presentation. You know, as we're sitting in the gallery watching our legislators pass laws, you know, we were horrified at the fact that it became like a Democrat versus Republican fight. Education is the foundation of our democracy. It's, you know, just so important and we didn't want this to turn into a fight of one side against another. We also talk about the different school systems in Arizona, the public school system, charter schools and private schools. And we don't shame anyone for choosing one system over another, but we simply provide the information so that you can make a good choice. So those things are really important to us when we started this presentation. As I started to do my research, I thought it was really interesting and you know, pretty cool that Arizona wrote in you know, education into our Constitution right from the beginning, 1911 and 1912 when it was ratified. Article 11 are all the um, sections that deal with education. And to me, the two most important ones that stuck out were section one and section 10. Section one talks about how the legislature is supposed to not only establish and maintain our public schools, but they're supposed to keep them as general and uniform as possible. So if you've been paying attention to the news lately, that's not something that's happening. You know, we have some amazing brand new schools with really beautiful buildings, and we have schools that are literally falling apart with the roof caving in. Section 10 is actually my favorite though because it talks about how the legislature is supposed to make appropriations for public schools to be met by taxation. So our legislature, who all swore an oath to uphold the Arizona Constitution, swore that they would make, use tax dollars to pay for public schools. So again, when we're hearing things that, what are happening in the news right now, passing of vouchers and all these things, sending our public tax dollars to private schools, they're going directly against what they swore to uphold in our Constitution. And this is not get guaranteed in every state constitution, so I think it's really important to know that how much Arizona valued public education when we started out. I thought it was really interesting too, this is two years ago, before kind of the Red for Ed and it was in the news every single day, that education was the number one issue to Arizona voters. I figured we're a border state, you know, we could have you know immigration or the economy, you know, we're such a business friendly state, that would be the number one issue. Education is actually the number one issue. And the majority of people in Arizona will pay, say they'll pay more in taxes if they know it goes to public education. It's also important to know that when we do surveys of CEOs and business leaders, you know, we ask them, what are the top challenges to doing business in Arizona? Every time, right, for the past several years, they say the number one and number two challenges to doing business in Arizona deal with education. One that we're, they know we're not investing enough in our public education system. So if you want to come here and set up a business from out of state, a CEO does not want to come and send their children to our public schools. Um, is they're also really concerned that we're not graduating an educated enough workforce to fill really high level jobs you know, that a lot of these companies want to bring in. So companies will come into Arizona and bring call center jobs and warehouse jobs. And we're missing out on some of those larger you know, high tech jobs and headquarters. 
Um, as an example, we were told by um, a former legislator that IKEA was willing to bring a national headquarters here, international headquarters to Arizona several years ago. And they decided not to. And in an email to the legislators, told them why. It's because you're not valuing public education. So we're losing out on a lot of these opportunities. It's also sad and kind of important to know that we've cut more from public education funding than any other state in the nation since the Great Recession. And that's totaled about four and a half billion dollars in the last 10 years. To no one's surprise, money's not you know, everything, but when you cut that much money in such a short amount of time, it's caused a lot of problems. Low teacher pay, under-resourced classrooms, buildings and buses that are falling apart. Uh, we have a massive teacher shortage, teacher shortage crisis that's happening right now, along with many other issues. Oh, my little graph, for some reason, is not popping up on this. But we have a nice little graph here. No, oh, it's just not going to pop up for some reason. I can still talk you through it. So if we talk top down, so in Arizona, we have about 7 million people. And this last year, fiscal year 2018, uh, we passed a budget of $10.4 billion. Now, there's normally a beautiful little pie graph here that breaks down what goes into that budget. And basically what it is, it pays for everything but our transportation. So transportation is a different fund in Arizona. That's paid for with different taxes, and we kind of keep that separate. When you hear general fund or the state budget, that's kind of interchangeable. So in that category, basically three main things health, human services, public safety, and public education. So you have our state access program, university funding, Department of Corrections, economic security, all those things take up um, yeah. what's on our general fund. You can't see this as well, but education, K-12 education, takes up about 43% of our overall budget. And you hear that statistic a lot when you have politicians talking about, you know, what more do you want? Our, we, we spend 43%, almost half of our budget, on education. That's amazing. The problem is not the size of that piece of pie. It's not the proportion that K-12 education gets. It's the size of the overall general fund. So I always joke with people, if I give you the option and I say, do you want 43% of a personal pan pizza? Or do you want 43% of an extra large family pizza? Which one are you going to choose? Right? It's pretty simple. You're going to want 43% of the larger, larger pizza for your family. So in Arizona, it's not the percentage, it's not the breakdown of where the money goes. It's just the overall size of our budget. It's too small for how many people live here in Arizona. So here's an example of that. I'll show you a few states with similar budgets to ours. Because you're all really smart people, I think you're going to notice something pretty quickly when you look at these numbers. I'm going to wait for you all to pick up your jaws off the, off the floor because, as you can see pretty quickly, you know, we have a 10 billion budget, so these are all relatively in our neighborhood. But then you look, we have 7 million people, and then there's Wyoming. They have half a million people. You know, so if you divide that out, these amounts, you know, you do the math, each one of those people, they're getting a larger portion of those funds. So education, <coughs> police. Firefighters, you know, health services, everyone's getting more money. Now, how each of these states put money into the general fund is different. But we are comparing basically the same thing. So each state, the big three expenses are pretty much health, human services, public safety, public education. So we're comparing similar things. How the money gets into the general fund is different for every state. You know, Alaska gets a lot of oil money, so that's why they have, you know, a fairly large budget for not a lot of people. Um, but again, we're comparing fairly similar programming. Then everyone asks me, okay, well, what about similar populations to ours? How much are their budgets? So I heard, yeah, you did a big talk on Massachusetts. You see right here, you know, three times as much as us. And it's, you know, I don't know that we'll ever be Massachusetts. I don't know if that's Arizona's value system, and I don't know that, you know, they have very high property taxes, all things like that, but it's to show that it's possible. Seven million people can generate $30 billion in revenue. It's possible. But then we throw in Tennessee and Washington, because I feel like that's a little bit more fair comparison, um, you know, just as far as our value system and how we kind of run things. And you can see 
it's still three to six billion dollars more than we are putting into our general funds. So again, we just have a massive revenue problem. Oh good, this graph showed up, that's good. <laughs> uh, how, so how does the money get into our funds? So we talked about just big picture, what the revenue looks like, and now we're gonna talk about how we get money into our general funds. And now this is 2016, just you know, government sources don't like to update too quickly, but it's fairly similar to this year. As you can see, we rely really heavily on sales tax. Um, this year it's about 51%, so it's a little bit less than it was in 2016. Income tax this year is about 37-38%, um, and then property taxes and license taxes are fairly similar. There's a couple problems with this. One, sales tax is really volatile, right? So if we have a great economic year, we're rolling in money. We have a recession, which we did, we have no money, you know, so that's very hard to budget and plan. You know, any person trying to make a budget and forecast out a few years, that's kind of a hard system to rely on. It's also really important to see that we rely so heavily on one source. What happens when that one source goes away? We don't have a backup, right? Other states kind of make it a little bit more equal, a little bit more even, so that, you know, in the case of a great recession, like we had in 2009, 10, 11, and we lost three to four billion dollars overnight. They, you know, other states had a little bit better chance of, you know, safeguarding, whereas we just had to cut everything overnight and we had no other backup source. The other problem is just, again, how much we rely on this sales tax. We have the high, one of the highest sales tax rates in the entire nation. Uh, we're about 11th right now. Depending on which source you look at, it can be even a little higher. This right here, this graph, what this shows you, so 0% is the national average for tax collection. These are all the different kinds of tax collections that we have um, for the most part in the country. As you can see here, this is this is from Arizona, where how much are we different from the national average? All these sources, we are below average, all the way up to almost 60% below average for these different kinds of tax collections, except for one, sales tax. We're almost 50% higher than the national average. Another big problem with relying so heavily on sales tax is that it's a really highly regressive tax. So it very negatively impacts low and middle income families. And this graph just shows how drastically that occurs. Down here on the bottom, we have household incomes. Bottom fifth income is like a family of four making $16,000 or less per year. Top 1%, you know, is a family making over $250,000 to $500,000 a year. And these graphs represent, for every $100 in income, how much they pay in state and local taxes. So if you were one of this in the bottom fifth, family making less than $16,000 a year, for every $100 you make in income, you're going to pay $12.50 in taxes. If you're in the top 1%, for every $100 in income, you're only paying $4.58 in taxes. So again, this top 1% family might pay more in dollars, you know, they might pay more actual dollars, but it's a much lower percentage of their overall <coughs> income. And I like to give an example. I mean, I'm a business teacher, so I, I like the whole numbers thing, but I know that's not everyone's game. So I give a little example to help out. Let's say we have two families, and they both need to buy a brand new car. One family makes $50,000 a year. The other family makes a million dollars a year. They both want to buy a car. It's $20,000. The sales tax on both, for easy math, is $5,000. That $5,000 is a much larger portion of the $50,000 income then the $5,000 is to the million dollars income. So you can see how that really affects those low and middle income families at a much higher rate. Does that make sense to everyone? Again, we don't get too heavy into tax policy. This stuff is crazy enough as it is. Okay, so now we didn't see the graph, but there's the graph I gave you at the beginning and told you that K-12 education takes up 43% of our overall budget. This is how that money gets in there. So if you ever have insomnia, go to you know, azleg.gov, read the appropriations report, you'll be out in no time. I should have done that this morning in the rain. It kept me up all night. But um, so this is how that 43% gets made up. So if you just look at that 43%, this graph is how the money gets in there. Because everything you know, isn't just put into one pot. It has very specific places of where it all goes. Before I get to explaining this, you're going to see this word equalization. And when Arizona does something right in education, I like to talk about it. And one of those things is the equalization formula. 
And what that states is we've had it since 1980, and it says no matter where a kid lives in Arizona, they get the same per pupil funding from the state. Now that doesn't actually end up happening, but in theory, it shouldn't matter if the child lives in North Scottsdale or lives in a really low income area, they should have the same amount of money. You, know, you go to other states, and if you live in a really high you know, property value area, their schools are really well funded, and if you don't, the schools are not well funded. Well, we kind of try to make it so that they're a little bit more equal. And the way we do it is like this. I like to imagine per pupil funding as like a little bucket. And so what happens first is the first estate goes to local property taxes to fill up the bucket. Let's say we need $8,000 for per pupil funding. We go to the local property taxes first. So if you're in North Scottsdale, that bucket's going to get filled up a lot you know, by just the property taxes. And the state doesn't need to kick in any money. If we're in a lower income area and property tax only fills it up a little bit, the state out of the general fund will then kick in the rest of the money to kind of even them out. Now again, those buckets don't stay even and there's a lot of reasons why. But on paper, it's a really good thing that we at least try to make sure it's as even as possible. So then we see that 69% of the K-12 education comes from that equalization formula. We get 14% federal funds, local funding, and Prop 301, which we'll talk about those a little bit later as well. Now, the way this 69% equalization formula breaks down, it 57% gets kicked in by the state, 38% is that local property tax, and then we get a little bit from Prop 301 and the state land trust. So again, this little itty bitty graph is the 69%. This graph is the 43% of our overall budget, which is kind of how it breaks down. And before we move on, I want to talk to you really quickly about the state land trust, because we're going to need that later. We're going to, you're going to need that to be mad about something else later. <laughs> so the state land trust was something that was set up for Arizona right when we became a state, so in the early 1900s. The federal government set aside for us a big chunk of land and said, you know, you guys can rent out part of this land. You can sell little bits of it. You can charge people to graze cattle on it. You leave it alone. We're going to take all the money that you make off of this land, put it in an account. You can never touch the principal balance of this account, but you can draw a little bit off the interest of that account and use that specifically to fund schools. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. And I talked about how the buckets in Arizona are not equal. There are many reasons. So there's supplemental revenues that come in if you live in a really rural district, if you have a high percentage of veteran teachers, if you have a high percentage of students with special needs, those buckets get filled up differently. One of the biggest reasons in Arizona, though, why those buckets of per pupil funding are not equal is because of bonds and overrides. So if you go to other states, Bonds are fairly common. You go to the voters and ask in your district, you know, can you spend a little bit more on your property tax for a capital purchase? I want to build a new school, buy a bunch of new buses, you know, kind of that one-time capital expense. That's common. What's not as common, I've had people from other states go, I've never heard of this in my life, are these overrides. And what it does is it asks you to go to your district, anyone who lives within the boundaries of your district, vote on if they will increase their taxes, and then that allows that money to be spent above and beyond what their budget is for this district. So again, this just talks about M&O overrides for people and programs, capital override is for books, technology, and equipment. Um, so that happens a lot. So the problem with bonds and overrides, one, we've already paid our taxes. The state should be being good stewards of our tax dollars. We shouldn't, they shouldn't have to come back and ask us for more money. We've done it once. Number two, it's expensive to put a bond and override to the district. So you have to have money set aside to be able to pay for everything, to put it on a ballot to begin with. So it's depending on the size of your district and if there's other things on the ballot, you know, it could be anywhere from $20,000 up to three, dollars $400,000. So a district, it's a gamble. They keep that money and they say, I'm gonna use this money and spend it in hopes that they vote yes and I get millions of dollars for what I need. But there's times where you spend that money and the voters vote no and you're just out that money. Um, so again, it's very difficult. They disproportionately benefit wealthier school districts because again, they have that money set aside and usually they're able to reach voters and say, please vote yes, you need printing out pamphlets, um, have good outreach, higher voter turnout, all those things affect if we can pass a bond or override. Last November, every bond override got passed in Maricopa County. That's never happened before, so you could tell people are understanding how important it is. 
this November, there are several other districts asking for bonds and overrides, Mesa being one. If you live here, um, you can ask, look at your own districts to know if they're going to be asking for one or not. Um, but again, we shouldn't have to have them. They're not really a great way to rely on funding, to have to ask for it every few years. You feel like you're nickel and diming everyone. But at this point, we are so low on funding. Many districts, if they don't get this bond and override money, simply cannot exist. Where my children go to school, bond and overrides pay for all of our buses, all of our computers, you know, and many other things. So to, if we didn't get a bond and override passed, I don't know if they sell the buses or I don't know what happens, but it would be really dire for our district. I like to point this out, just add some perspective. Per pupil funding, if you average all those buckets out across the state, we have an average of about $7,500. Um, again, that number is different for every district, but um, that's an average. You see the top schools are all about $20,000 per student. You know, we're at the very bottom, 49. There's 51 because they include the District of Columbia. Um, just imagine what we could do if we had three times as much per pupil funding, what we could do for our children, for the buildings, for our teachers. So now there are many reasons. I told you we have a revenue problem. We don't have enough money in Arizona for how many people actually live here. So one of the big reasons, where's all the money going? Why don't we have enough money? A lot of the reasons are for corporate tax exemptions and corporate tax credits. Now you hear the word ta corporate tax or just tax exemption. People use that interchangeably with tax credit, tax incentive, tax cuts. It's, they're all different programs, but they're all a way that money is taken out of the general fund or blocked from getting in the general funds. So this is all money that should be put into our budget every year, but for some reason has been diverted elsewhere. We're going to talk really specifically about um, tax credits because that's we have so many in Arizona and that's where a lot of our money goes. Tax credit, um, most of us take advantage of this kind of program. You can donate to a third party organization, whether it's an animal shelter, a local school, and at the end of the year you subtract that amount for how much you owe on your taxes for a dollar for dollar basis. So if you donate $300, in the year, you subtract $300. That's how that works. Problem with tax credits. So again, I'm a business teacher, so I'm like, well, there's got to be a reason. We have so many. We have over 331 in Arizona. There should be a good reason. Not really. So they lack accountability. We don't know in any given year how many tax credits are going to be claimed, nor do we know what they do with the money once that the dollars go there. So in theory, they're tax dollars. They should be paid in taxes. They're being donated elsewhere. We don't know what they do with that money. You know, every other government program, you track where your tax dollars go and show outcomes and make sure that they're going where they're supposed to be going. Problem is, too, you don't, um, there's no control over them. So some of these tax credit programs are allowed to grow exponentially every year. You know, those kind of things. Again, we don't have control over what, what happens with that money. <laughs> Another issue is that, you know, it basically helps short-term growth, so I'm thinking, okay, well, again, there has to be a reason we have these. Short-term, they're great. You know, they get people spending money, they help organizations, it's great. The problem is when you leave them on the books too long. So it really hinders long-term growth. If you're restricting the amount of money the state can collect, we can't grow our programs, we can't grow different things. So it really hinders the long-term view of the economy. Something important to know is that to pass a new tax credit, it's just a simple majority in the legislature pretty easy to do. So we've passed a new tax credit every year for the last 17, 18 years. If you want to repeal it, so we do audits on some of these and we know, yes, it's helping the economy, yes, it's hurting it or it's having no effect. Let's repeal it. It's not a simple majority. You need to have two thirds of our legislature agree to take away a tax credit. So you can all imagine how often two thirds of our legislature agree on anything. It doesn't happen. They don't repeal tax credits. Um, and a lot of these are just outdated programs that we don't even need anymore. So another fun party game, if you're ever bored, go to the uh, Department of Revenue. Look up all the different 331 tax credits and really say, oh, you know, is this real or is this made up? It's a fun game you can play. We have ones for horse vitamins. We have ones, if you want to buy a three inch pipe or a five inch pipe in Arizona, you'll pay tax on it. If you want to buy a four inch pipe, you don't have to pay tax on that. Why? Because the lobbyists, for Southwest Gas, use four inch pipes. So they get the tax credit for that. Outdated farming equipment that we don't even use anymore. Um, if you're out of state and you come by artwork in Arizona, you won't pay tax on it. But if 
we want to go buy art and we live here, we will pay tax on it. Just tons of crazy things. It's basically a game of who has the best lobbyist. And it's not something that's beneficial for the entire state. 75% of corporations in Arizona pay $50 to our state in taxes. And that's not a misprint. That's not, you know, I'll say it again. Three quarters of our corporations, Target, Walmart, GoDaddy, PetSmart, they pay $50, five zero, in taxes. Now how many, think of your own taxes, how many of you paid more than $50 in state taxes? I know I did. The way they're able to do this is by taking advantage of so many different tax credits. They can write off everything that they owe, and by the end of the year, it's $50. And that $50 is really just a filing fee. That's why that dollar amount exists. <laughs> we have the sixth highest or sixth lowest corporate tax rate in the entire nation. You know, they this is how they reduce all their income or their uh, state taxes at the end of the year. Another huge problem is something called carry forward. So let's say I donate $10,000 in tax credits, but I only owed $5,000 at the end of the year. The state lets me keep that extra $5,000 for whenever I need it, anywhere from five to 15 years. You can use it in the year that you don't make as much money or you, know, you don't donate as much in tax credits. So right now, that amount of money, which is a debt that the state of Arizona owes to corporations and individuals is a billion dollars. So at any time, people could claim this billion dollars and that will be taken out of our general fund. The other crazy thing is, let's say we got rid of every tax credit program available today. It will still take us 15 years to catch up from how much money we've been giving away in these tax credit programs. Small business, I hear this all the time, right? Again, from politicians, what about small businesses? Let's protect our small businesses. Well, in Arizona, our tax code highly favors corporations at the expense of small business. One reason is we have such a high sales tax. So again, you're a small business, you have things that are made locally, they cost a little bit more money. Then you add really high sales tax on top of that, people are less likely to go buy those products you know, when they're already expensive and then you're having to pay more in sales tax. The other problem is, again, there's just there are tax credit programs available for small businesses, but not as many. I have a friend who owns a small business, pays $20,000 a year in taxes, and then PetSmart's paying $50. And it makes no sense because if we really cared about growing our economy and doing what's best for Arizona citizens, we would give tax breaks and tax exemptions to small businesses. Because if you look at Local First website, they talk to you about how much benefit a small business is to the local economy. A local retailer returns half of their revenue to the local economy, whereas a big store like Target's returning 14% of their revenue. Restaurants, it's even crazier. 80% of everything a restaurant makes, a local restaurant, is returned to our local economy. And then you see a chain restaurant's only 30%. So it's a big deal. That's a really big area where we can grow and help our local economy. Here's an example. So I told you there's over 331 tax credit programs available. This is <coughs> one of those programs. And it's a corporate tax credit for private schools. So again, remember the Constitution. Tax dollars have to go to fund public schools. This is tax dollars going to fund private schools. This particular program has cost the state a billion dollars over the last 10 years. A billion, with a B. The red is how much is allowed to be claimed through this specific program. So if you go look at the Department of Revenue site, it talks to you about each tax credit program, how much is allowed to be claimed. The crazy thing about this program is that amount's allowed to increase 20% a year, every year, forever. There's never a cap. Think of any other government spending program. Is it allowed to increase their budget every 20% a year, every year, forever? Your own personal budget? Are you allowed just to increase your own budget 20%? I mean, I wish I could, right? Wish I could increase my budget 20% a year. But it, there's no cap on this. It can grow forever. The blue is what's actually been claimed. So except for that little dip during the Great Recession, it's been maxed out every single year. So we have some people saying, well, let's just get rid of this program. Let's save ourselves $80, $100 million a year. Some people say, well, we don't need to get rid of it. Let's just cap it. So this year, 2018, it's almost $80 million. If we simply said, let's cap it, and it can never cost the state more than $80 million, as you can see, in just the next two years, we can save almost $30 million just by putting a cap on the program. 
So there's lots of ways to kind of raise that revenue and kind of hold these programs more accountable, you know, that we could have that debate if we needed to. In 1980, we had five different tax credit programs, and now we have over 331. The crazy thing is, we give away more money in all these different tax exemptions and tax credit programs than we actually bring in to our general fund. So if you add it all up, we give away about $14 billion a year, and as I showed you before, our general fund budget is $10 billion. So again, if we ended every tax credit program, we'd automatically have $14 billion. We ended all of our tax exemptions, $14 billion. 14 plus 10 is 24. Hey, we're Massachusetts. <laughs> These are laws already on the books. We're simply not collecting the tax laws that are already on the books. So that's crazy. So when I hear, oh, we're a fiscally responsible state, or you know, we have, we're so good with our money, if I gave away more money than I brought in every year, I'd be bankrupt and homeless, and they wouldn't care. But yet, that's what we're doing as a state. We're giving away more money than we're bringing in. They don't have the and money. Somehow, that's okay. They don't have the money for homeless services. Right. So you think of, <laughs> yeah, they don't. They wouldn't have enough money to help me out there. The other crazy thing is, you're going to hear a lot, and it's a commercial right now for one of the politicians. I am proud that we have a balanced budget in Arizona. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know about that. The crazy thing is, we don't have a balanced budget. We've had what's called a structural deficit since the year 2007. And all that is is a funny little accounting trick. So you do your accounting every year, your budget. In Arizona, if it's an ongoing expense, we include that in our budget, in that $10.4 billion. So if it's something that we do every year, that's included. If it's a one-time expense that happens all within one fiscal year, we don't have to include that in our budget. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I mean, if I have to buy a car, let's say I buy a used car and it's $10,000, like, I don't get to just go, that's not, a, I didn't need to account for that money. I didn't actually spend $10,000 this year. No one else can do that. I mean, we're not the only state that uses that kind of, you know, funny accounting, but it's crazy to me that you don't get to brag that we have a balanced budget when that's not really what's happening. <clears throat> I know, take a breath. Like, it just gets so depressing. So then I kind of say, everyone's like, what's going on? Has it always been this awful? You're about ready to run out and like throw things. The funny thing is, it hasn't always been this bad. So we set up the state land trust. We wrote education into our constitution. Up until the 1960s, we were in the top 20% of per, per pupil funding for the entire nation. We ranked 19th. So we actually do, used to do a really good job. So what happened? Well, it didn't go straight down like this. I'm just not a graphic designer, so I couldn't really show you what it is. So we're at 19th, and then the 90s dropped in the 90s, dropped in the 2010s. It's not an accident. This wasn't like, oops, we made a mistake, or oh, some things happened. We did this to ourselves. In the 1990s, we voted on, taxpayers voted on, a massive property tax cut and a massive income tax cut. So again, I showed you that graph of how we get all of our money into our general fund, and we have huge reliance on sales tax. Well, it's because we voted on and said, yeah, we don't need this property and income tax. Okay, yeah, we do. I mean, no one likes paying taxes, but we also want to live in a nice, you know, well-paid-for society. Um, the other thing that happened in the 90s, some out-of-state interest groups looked at Arizona and said, hmm, there, I want to try some things there. Groups like Koch Brothers, the Waltons, Betsy DeVos, all these people, 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago, said, I want to try some things there. Their vision for education is to privatize all schools because they see that 43% as money that they want. Right now, they're not collecting that 43% of money. It's the largest portion of most states' budgets, and they're not getting any of it, so they want it. So how do they do that? They privatize all schools, and they get to keep that money. So what they start to do is buy our politicians, write legislation, and give it to our politicians to sign their names on. Okay, and we know this is true. This is not conjecture. They brag about it online. I mean, they're not, they don't hide the fact. So it's turned us into the most corrupt state in the nation, according to a Harvard study. We also have the most dark money in our politics of any other state. So that's money that we don't know where it comes from. I mean, we do know where it comes from because, again, they brag about it. They're so brazen now. But again, their vision of this is no taxes. Everything's privatized. That doesn't really work. It doesn't work for education for a lot of reasons. So that's kind of what's got us to where we are today. 
I'm going to talk about each of these more specifically, but I just want to show you it's a long ball game. So if they had come in in the 90s and made every change overnight, we would have noticed. We would have rioted in the streets. We would have been upset, frustrated. Problem is they didn't do that. Small little changes over 20 years. So we all were asleep. We didn't notice or thought, okay, one thing isn't too bad. It was bad. It's, I mean, it would be genius. If it wasn't so evil, right? It would be really just smart because, again, they got to do what they wanted to do. Start in 95. We passed the most expansive charter school law in the entire country, also the most unregulated charter school laws in the country. Um, open enrollment, site based decision making. And that's important to point out because it's good and bad. The state hands the school some money in the form of district additional assistance, and they kind of say, you should spend it on this, but what happens is the district kind of has some leeway. So, you know, a rural district has much different needs than an inner city district. So they kind of have that flexibility to spend that money on whatever they need most. And that's good. Where it's bad is the state will say, here's a chunk of money, you should spend this on teacher pay. Well, I have a district whose roofs collapsed and, you know, their buses don't work, and they say, well, it doesn't matter if I can pay my teachers better. If there's roof collapse, I can't even have class. So they use that money to fix the buildings. They don't have any money left to pay teachers. And the state goes, well, I told you to. Well, you're not giving us enough money to pay for everything else. You know, so it's a way for the state to pass blame onto school districts. When our districts really are doing a pretty good job, they have, we have one of the lowest administrative costs in the entire nation. So we hear that a lot, too. Well, I hope the districts are spending their money well. We are. We rank in the bottom three for low administrative costs. We spend more in the classroom than almost every other state in the nation. Um, then we have our first voucher program in 1997, school tuition tax credit. That's what our Senate President Steve Yarbrough owns. Um, that's an aside, just because I think it's important to know which lawmakers own companies that make money off of tax dollars. The year 2000, voters approved Prop 301. 2006, we had another attempt at a voucher program. That one was ruled unconstitutional because it violated church and state laws. They didn't give up, though. They weren't going to give up that easy. So in 2011, they came up with a new fancy name, Empowerment Scholarship Account. <laughs> it's vouchers. It's vouchers. Um, so those passed. Um, 2016, we had Prop 301. And then 2017, ESA program was expanded. So when the ESAs were first created, they did it, again, not because they cared, but because they knew this is a good way to do it. They only let certain students take a voucher. Students with special needs, military families, students in a DRF school, foster families. Only they can get a voucher, and that's great. That program was a small program, kind of was doing well, you know, didn't ruffle any feathers. Well, in 2017, they said, well, now anyone can get a voucher. You don't need to have a special condition. So those of us sitting there watching this happen said, well, can we at least make sure that those kids who already need a voucher get first priority? I mean, if you're a special needs family, you should get whatever you need to help your student with special needs. Make them get first priority. And they go, no. OK, can you increase the accountability measures to make sure our tax dollars are going where they need to go? No. OK, can you make there be like an income limit so this helps lower income families before you know wealthy people can take advantage? No. So again, their goal is to privatize all schools in Arizona. It's not for any nice reason. I'll remind you that we cut more than any other state in the nation. And we were at the bottom before the recession. Every state cut education funding during the recession. It was a bad time. Everyone else, when the economy recovered, started reinvesting, we kept cutting. That's the problem. If you add up from 1993 to 2016, all those cuts I talked about, the property tax cut, the income tax cut, all the vouchers taking money away from our schools, if you add that up of the money that should have gone to our general fund, it's two, over $2 billion a year. If you Count for inflation and population growth, it's almost $5 billion. So it's $5 billion that should be in our general fund every year if we had kept the laws in place that we had before, but that's not what's happening. The largest funding cuts are full day kindergarten, capital funding, building renewal formula, colleges and universities, and our community colleges. So we'll talk real quick about community college. It's not K 12 education, but I think it's important. First, we'll talk about the university. So 10 years ago, the state had paid for about 75% um, of the cost to educate a resident Arizona student. Now we pay 34%. We are one of the only states that don't have a tuition assistance program to help out with these high costs. I mean, if you, I think I went to college you know, 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago. 
tuition has more than like 10 times as much now. I pay $2,000, I think, a semester. I have friends with kids going now pay $20,000 a semester. I mean, it's insane. The other problem is we, you know, we used to have this robust course catalog. You know, now we have all these cuts. We have less courses to offer students and teachers, university professors, can get paid more just by going to another state. So we're not getting that. And universities are really important for a local economy because we have innovation. We do all these things that really benefit the local economy. Do everything that help would help the state out. Another thing we'll talk about is community colleges. So if you look right here. 2009, how much money needs to get to Maricopa and Pima Community Colleges? And then we look over the last several years, then we get to zero. 2017, zero. 2018, zero. Now, Maricopa Community Colleges, College District is one of the largest in the entire country. Community colleges are vitally important to the economy because that's where you go. Not everyone's going to go to a four-year university. Some people just want to get job skills training quickly. If you lose your job and you're an older adult, you go to a community college to gain new skills to get a new job. So it literally is what keeps the economy humming as far as the job market. Now this is just a fun graphic from the Students Association. This is this past year, so just in May of the budget that was passed. ASU gets 42 million from the state. U of A gets 2.2 million. NAU gets 1.6 million. MCC, Maricopa Community Colleges gets zero. PCC gets zero. But then look at this. Freedom Schools gets $7.5 million. So pretty much more than all three of our universities combined. What's a Freedom School, you ask? If you don't know those faces, you should. It's the Koch brothers. They set up these awesome little schools in the middle of ASU and U of A. Service is about 30 people at ASU and even less at U of A. And the state, our actual state, gave our tax dollars to this private program at a university, $7.5 million. And what do they do there? They teach their fun brand of economics. No taxes, and everything will still work. Why does the university let this happen? Well, so the question was, why does the university let this happen? Well, when, yeah, money. I mean, so ASU had their budgets cut, and U of A's had their budgets cut. Koch brothers say, well, you know, we'll, we'll let you come here. We'll give you some money. They go, OK. So I asked you, what do you do with $7.5 million and 30 students? Well, we found someone who knows someone who teaches in the program. And they get to have all expense paid trips all around the world and meals and all these wonderful things, you know, free school. So yeah, crazy. Again, public tax dollars going to private schools. It's against our Constitution, but it's happening. Prop 301. So voters approved Prop 301 in the year 2000. It's directed uh, our sales tax to be a little bit higher, and it's going to go directly to schools. Important to know that when we vote on something as a proposition, it's called voter protected, meaning the legislature can't mess with the money. Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. Um, we'll get back to that. Um, so we increased sales tax, gave a one-time uh, payment for school buildings, and what happened during the Great Recession, when I told you we lost $4 billion overnight, the legislature just stopped paying this money to schools. But remember I said it's voter protected and that's illegal. They did it anyways. So what happened, the Education Association, the School Board Association sued the state of Arizona, went to the state Supreme Court. They won because it's illegal and they said, you have to pay back the schools. And the legislature said, yeah, we're never going to do that. They said it. We're never we're gonna keep it mediation litigation forever. We're never gonna pay it back. So at the time, Governor Ducey was the executive branch, and we have checks and balances. Judicial says one thing, exec or legislative says one thing, executive branch comes in to save the day. I'll get back to that. Um, what also is important to know is that we approved this for 20 years. So in 2021, we were gonna voters so we're gonna have to vote on it again. Yes, do we want to keep this program in place? Well, this year, what happened was, you know, 50 to 70,000 people went and stood outside of the governor and the legislator's offices and were yelling pretty loudly, got them scared. And instead of just actually doing what they were supposed to do and maybe just funding education properly, they said, well, I know, we'll just renew Prop 301. It's great, we need the money, but renewing it did nothing. It was, you know, just for show. We could have just voted on it in a few years. Didn't generate any new money, but it was just a way for the legislature to go, look, we're doing something. We were. The worst part of this is now the legislature renewed it. It's no longer voter protected. 
so they get to control that money. And the very next day, our very favorite Senate president, who is the head of the Education Committee, said, now we get to tinker with the money. So hopefully not, but they now have control over that money. Um, Prop 301, so let's get back to that, or Prop 123 settlement, which is what we sued over from Prop 301. So again, we're fighting. You pay the money. No, we're never going to. Governor Ducey, who is the executive branch, says, I'll fix this, I'll fix this. What we'll do is we'll take a big chunk out of the state land trust, principal balance, we'll change how much we can collect on interest from the state land trust, and we'll pay back the schools what they, we owe them. Think about that for a moment. Barb, I owe you $20. I'm not going to pay you $20. I'm only going to pay you back $15. But I'm going to go into your bank account and take out $15 and hand it to you and say, we're good, right? <laughs> That's exactly what happened. So everyone's like, minds get blown. Like, what? Why did this happen? Why did you let this happen? Well, if you're a school and you have had billions of dollars cut from your budget in the last few years, you're climbing along in the desert, you're starving, you're dying, someone hands you a glass of water, you don't go, wait a minute, where did that come from? Where's my next glass of water gonna come from? No, you take it and you drink it and you just, you live another day. That's what they had to do, so the schools agreed to it. However, it was illegal, you're not supposed to touch the principal balance of that account. The first two years of the program, it went to court. The first two years were illegal. Magically, they got congressional approval this year to make sure that it was okay. But we'll see what ends up happening with that. Problem is, it wasn't enough. So you can see this is everything that was cut over here on this side. It's everything that they didn't pay back. Here's what they did pay back. You know, so we took money from our own account. You know, it wasn't enough money. And then what happens when you take money out of a principal balance of any account? Can't get interest later, right? So that will cost us $8 billion over the next 40 years. So not only do they steal money, they're stealing money from my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids over the next 40 years. I know, it was, very, it was a very stressful time. It was a contentious vote. That only passed 49 to 48%. People knew it was terrible, but you know, again, you just do whatever you can to stop the bleeding. Now we'll talk about vouchers. Vouchers are fun. We have two voucher programs in Arizona. Student or school tuition organizations, STO. Um, what happens then is I owe taxes. Instead of paying them as the general fund, I pay it to a third party company. That company gets to keep 10% for management fees. And they give the other 90% to a private school. That uh, primarily uh, helps wealthier families because you have to be able to write that $2,000 check, goes to a private school. You can get multiple STOs to pay for all the tuition um, for a private school. Um, they primarily help you know, wealthier families, but they do help some lower income families. 40% of those go to families making less than $42,000 a year. So it's a tax credit program linked with vouchers. ESAs are different. So I already told you a little bit about how it was a small program to start. They voted to open it up to anyone. What an ESA is, so that's not a uh, tax credit. What it does is it comes out of the general fund. They put it on a debit card and they hand it to a family and say, use this to pay for private school or homeschool expenses if you qualify. It's literally a debit card. So most people, it's a small program, 3,000 kids take advantage. Most of the families use it appropriately, but as you can imagine, you get handed a debit card with tax dollars. There is some fraud in the system. Um, it's just it's difficult to keep track of. Well, now they want to expand it to everyone. Well, the last summer, Save Our Schools Arizona, if you've heard of them, collected signatures on a petition to stop that law from going into effect, and we're voting on it in November. So if you hear Prop 301, this is what this has to do with the expansion part of the voucher. So if you vote yes on 305, it's Proposition 305, if you vote yes on 305, it means yes, I want vouchers for everybody. If you vote no on 305, it means no, I don't want vouchers expanded. But it keeps that small program in place. So if you're a kid with special needs, you still will get your voucher. But you don't want it expanded to everyone. So no on 305 means no, I don't want vouchers. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time on this next section because I feel like with Red for Ed and all that crazy stuff that happened, we're well aware of all the problems that it causes. Um, we have the, we're 49th in per pupil funding. We have the second highest class size in the entire nation. We have the highest student to counselor ratio in the nation. 924 to 1. 
That's an average. So there's counselors in Mesa who have 1,300 kids. The national average is about 450 for one, and the recommended is 220 or 250 to one. So we're, you know, we're three times higher than the national or the recommended average, and twice as high as the national average. To no one's surprise, smaller classes mean better outcomes, especially for the really little kids. You know, if you're in kindergarten, you have 18 kids or less, you'll have a much higher chance of having good reading and math outcomes. Really important too for low-income minority and ELL students as well. We rank 49th in the U.S., even after the big 20 by 20, 20 raise. That didn't happen. Um, we're still at the bottom. It's a massive labor issue right now, actually. I went to a presentation just talking about how if the teacher labor market crumbles, which it's already crumbling, how it will ripple the entire economy in Arizona. It's really, really dire. Um, we can immediately move to any of these states and make $20,000 more a year. A lot of people who live on our borders do drive, teach somewhere else, and come back. People do point out, oh, well, we have a low cost of living here. Well, our high sales tax kind of negates a lot of those benefits, you know, and they make 14% less now than they made in 2001. So people say, why do teachers deserve a 20% raise? I've never gotten a 20% raise in my life. Well, they make 14% less than they did in 2001, so 20% doesn't even catch them up to inflation. The biggest issue with this labor market crisis is that we have a huge teacher shortage crisis. So at the beginning of the year, and it's similar for this year, the numbers just came out, we needed about 8,000 teachers. By the end of the year, we still needed 2,000 teachers. That's 60,000 kids in Arizona that never got a teacher, a full-time teacher. 4,000 of those positions were filled by long-term subs. 120,000 kids have someone in front of them that's not a certified teacher. All you need is a fingerprint clearance card to be a long-term sub. And why does that matter? So I have a story that I always tell of a friend of mine. She's an English teacher, a ninth grade English teacher at a high school. She had a kid come to her and say, will you tutor me in math? I need help. She's like, well, I'm an English teacher, but you know, teachers are amazing. They do everything for everyone. So she said, yes, I'll help you. <laughs> Starts helping him and is like, you know, you're not, you're doing not too bad. Like you're good at math. What's the deal? And he's like, well, sixth grade, it was my best subject and I had all A's and it was great. Seventh grade, halfway through the year, my teacher left. And I had a sub who just came and passed out worksheets all day. Eighth grade, I never had a teacher as well, passed out worksheets all day. So he's a year and a half behind by the time he gets to high school. Tried his best, ends up dropping out of school. So again, it's not enough just to have a warm body in front of our kids. We need qualified teachers who can really help them so that it doesn't ripple effect later on. Um, we also have a quarter of our teachers who are eligible to retire soon. And the crazy thing is, we actually don't have a shortage of teachers. So if you go to the Department of Education, we need about 60,000 teachers in Arizona to fill for the 1.1 million kids we have. If you go down to the Department of Education, we have 90,000 teaching certificates on file. We should have 30,000 teachers like banging down the doors to help out, but you know why would they? There's so many issues. Teachers can make more doing a comparable profession. You know They're not gonna come back. Saying all this too, I wanna say, for how bad teachers have it right now, our kids actually achieve at about 50% of the national average. Like we're in the middle of the pack. So our kids are achieving really well. Our kids aren't achieving last place in the nation. Our kids are doing pretty well. Why is that? You know, our teachers are just working their tails off you know, to make sure our kids are getting what they need. So they're doing all this work and they're just you know, taking more and more and more of themselves. So it's important to know that our kids are still actually doing really well and achieving at a decent level despite all of the challenges presented and thrown at teachers. Um, another issue, we have capital funding issues. We're being sued again, yay, they're suing the state. You know, they're not paying capital funding. So we have buses driving 100,000 miles past their expiration date, roofs caving in, intercoms that don't work, safety issues like that. Um, school districts are left to come up with a difference with bonds and overrides to kind of help insulate from these cuts that have happened. Two billion dollars just from this one line item have been cut. Schools are supposed to get between 450 and 490 per student for capital funding. I step aside and whisper to you that number hasn't changed since the 80s. Okay, let's pretend though it's enough money and that's okay. It's not. But let's say that 450 to 490 is an acceptable amount. Right now they're getting 40 to 80 dollars per kid. It's just not enough. Last thing we'll talk about is the differences in all of our school systems. So school choice is not going anywhere in Arizona. It's 
here to stay. However, we're not making true school choice. We are not choosing apples and oranges. We're choosing between apples and horses. Because all three school systems are not forced to play by the same rules. And it gives the ones that do play by the fair rules a bad name because they're getting lumped in with all these groups taking advantage of the system. Charter and district schools are both considered public schools in Arizona. Both receive public funding. Charter schools are private contractors that receive taxpayer dollars to run their school. So I can buy land, building, and equipment, and the state will pay me death. The state will let me, give me money to run it every year and say after 10 years I'm tired of running a charter school. Well, I get to sell it and keep all the money. And that just happened fairly recently in the news, I think, if you know. One of our other legislators, legislators, the head of the ethics committee, got to sell his charter school and make 11 to $30 million of our taxpayer dollars, puts it in his pocket. Wow, that's fair. Um, if you, a district school closes, you have to go to the voters and they decide what happens with it. And the money goes back to the state where the voters decide that money goes, we own our district school. So we decide what happens. We don't get to just, the principal doesn't get to sell it and put the money in their pocket. Um, also, charter schools have self-appointed school boards, so they don't have to comply with open meeting laws all the time or post board docs. You can vote on your school board and make sure they're held accountable. Another thing is district schools have to provide transportation and lunch. Charter schools do not have to provide transportation and lunch. So to go to a charter school, you have to have the privilege of getting there, and your family has to have the money to pay for your meals. And you can imagine low-income students, that's not something they're able to take advantage of as readily. Another important thing is um, charter schools don't have to provide as much information as district schools do as far as student outcomes, where the money goes. Um, they can have for-profit companies manage the school and make millions and millions of dollars. And statistically, if you look over a longitudinal study, charter schools serve fewer students with ELLs and disabilities um, than district schools do. By law, both are supposed to accept every kid who comes in the door. Charter schools have ways around that. And again, there are wonderful charter schools serving those populations. They're getting a bad name by the ones that don't. You know, so they're getting dragged in with all this. And new district schools are only built where there's a need. You know, charter schools can pop up anywhere. Now, how they get money is different too. So we talked about district schools. The first funding source is property tax. Then the state kicks in the rest of the money. Charter schools don't have that geographic boundary, so all of the money comes from the state. And it's important to note because these numbers get thrown out a lot. Charter schools get more money from the state than district schools do. And the reason for that is they say, well, you can't get bonds and overrides, you can't do all these other things, so we'll give you extra money. Now, if you include federal funding, district schools get more than charter schools. And those just get thrown around in the news a lot, so I like to point it out. Both can get a tax credit for $400 for a couple, and they can only spend it on very specific things. They can't just spend that on teacher salary. Private schools obviously charge tuition, can get two different voucher programs. Um, they can also get a tax credit up to $2,000 and they can spend it on whatever they want. There's no requirements. Homeschool is different for each county in Arizona, but if you want to send your homeschool kid to a district school for sports or for music, the district school has to accept them. Now again, I don't advocate for one type of school system over another, but I think it's important to know that you are guaranteed certain things by law by attending a district school, that you're not guaranteed if you attend a different school system. You're guaranteed your teachers are certified, background checked, fingerprint clearance checked. Now the good charter schools and the good private schools absolutely have certified teachers who have passed all these checks. They're just not required to by law. Um, they have to follow all laws and guidelines, federal ideal laws, follow the state constitution. District schools have to serve all students. If you suspect your child has gifted or has special needs, the district school has to provide those services for your child. Um, they also have to have freedom of information and report student outcomes. You can go to any school district and ask them, how many students do you serve? How many students achieved at the certain level? They have to tell you. Other schools don't. Um, and there are schools in all areas. So even if you're a rural kid, you live an hour away from your nearest public school, by law, the state drives, picks up your kid and brings them to school. 80% of the charter private schools you know, are in Phoenix, Tucson, Flagstaff, you know, all the big cities. You know, not many private and charter schools out in rural areas. So that's it. I'm not gonna ask you to do crazy things. Just take this information. But then people say, well, what can I do? How do I make this better? 
You go to your PTO meetings. You support your school carnival. You know, you help out schools whenever you can. I told you districts, school districts are doing a really good job with what they have, but you attend your school board meetings. You attend those district meetings. Make sure they're spending the money properly. In my district, we have four board members out of the five who do not support public schools and want to privatize schools. That blows my mind because it's the worst job ever. I mean, they, they don't get paid and they have so much to do. I don't know why you do that unless you really supported schools. I'm not fooled anymore. So make sure you know who you're voting for. Make sure you hold them accountable. If you want to go crazy, start attending your LD meetings. What district do you live in? Contact your legislators. You have one senator and two representatives. Call the governor's office. You know, don't be afraid to make those statements and tell them you support. You know, no politician is going to tell you, I don't like education. They all say, I support education. Okay, well, do you support adequately funding public education? Do you, do you take money from the Koch brothers? Do you support vouchers? You can ask a lot of these questions to find out how they really feel about education. And I think that's important. So again, share this information with people. If you'd like to have us present to a group of one of your friends, we will. If you want to be a presenter, let us know. We have a website that has links to um, candidate report cards, all these things that can help you do research. Again, it doesn't matter which party you belong to. If you support education, there's information out there to help you pick the people who will best lead for that situation. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. If you have comments or questions for Sarah, raise your hand. Oh. I know, take a deep breath. And I will, if you somehow get me your email or if you go to our website, our email's on there, I will send you a PDF of this. It's a lot of information, so I want to make sure you know that. Yeah. If I live in Alice in Wonderland and I call this a partisan. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Joe. <laughs> Joe. Yeah. Wait, yes. oh. Oh, the microphone. microphone back here. <laughs> Wait your turn, I'll be right there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, oh, I'm sorry. I feel really horrible because I used to support all this free market, free market voucher crap. Um, well, don't feel terrible. I always tell yeah. people, like, because they're sneaky. They're good at what they do. They make you sound like it's yeah. so amazing well, and was, helping kids. And I used to call myself a libertarian a, long, a while back, so I, I believe this, this crap. Anyway, um, but I, you were talking about a a um the the proposition i want to make sure i vote the right way so you said what was it was 305 305 is the only education initiative on the ballot okay and yeah. is that pro voucher or a, a so if you vote yes it means yes i love vouchers okay. if you vote no it means no i don't want universal vouchers okay so no on 305 okay yeah. I, I take a nonpartisan, nonpolitical stance, but you all can chime in of which one we should do. Thank you. You can talk with her individually later. Okay, Joe. Be right there with you. This is uh, a little bit cynic, but in what Alice in Wonderland can I not consider this a partisan? <laughs> because I know what makes all of those things happen. Yes. Okay, and I, I hear you. Right now, the leadership in our state for the past 20 years, we know who's been in power. And unfortunately, that small group of people has made these things happen. However, I give this presentation and go speak to people all over the state of Arizona. Both parties, I mean, I've been in a room, the Apache Junction Tea Party meeting. They hate vouchers. They don't agree with this. I don't think, you know, I think if you go to your average Republican friend, we all agree that public education is really important. You go to your average, you know, Democrat friend, public education is important. It's unfortunate that a small group of a certain party has been corrupted by money and power. But I don't think that's the way Arizona citizens feel. I know when I'm out, whether it's with teachers during Red for Ed Week or, you know, collecting signatures last summer, I stood side by side with Republicans and Democrats and independents, and we all feel the same thing. It's just a matter of knowing who you're voting for. There are, there are Republicans in our legislature that did not vote for this voucher bill. Michelle Udall was one of them, you know, Heather Carter, Kate Brophy McGee. There are people who are doing the right thing. Unfortunately, it's a, small, a very small portion of one party that's taking over right now. Thank you. So hopefully no more. 
Um, yeah, and kind of on that point too, any, anybody that I've talked to on this sort of subject, no matter the party lines, will they'll in, may initially think that privatization is working, but when we look at kind of the stats that you showed to suggest that it's not, they come around to the idea that it's just about having the conversation about what actually is rather than drawing the party line. Uh, that's, that's why that, that is important. But to that point, you mentioned that students are performing at about 50% of the, the national average still, despite all the other terrible statistics in the slides. So is it illustrated that student performance is impacted? Were we above 50% in the past? What is the, because that's, that's the real important uh, value that we're looking at here. So if that's not affected, is it how much of this is actually an issue? Yeah, so it's hard to measure that because every state has different testing and different standards that they base on this. The reason, one of the main reasons they feel like Arizona has done so well is that we implemented the Common Core standards um, across the board, even though that's a very controversial issue. Um, it's helped a lot of kids perform better. Now, we are still not where we want to be. I mean, there's 43% achievement in math and literacy rates for third and eighth graders. Um, so there's, you know, but that unfortunately is decent in this country, so we're working on that. Um, but yes, money is, I mean, directly tied. If you pay teachers more, their student outcomes improve. Smaller class sizes mean their outcomes improve. So it's hard to measure the overall picture when our students are doing so well. But if you look at individual measures, you can find plenty of research to show that more money, more well-funded system increases student outcomes. And if you look at voucher programs, states like Louisiana and Michigan who've implemented large voucher programs, those students don't achieve at any higher level than district public schools. They actually go down for a few years and achieve worse, and then they kind of meet back up at the same level as districts. So. Um, it, it's a hard research topic though because every state does things so differently, but there's plenty of research to show it. You mentioned on several occasions in your, in your presentation about the influence of the Koch brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding is that this is the agenda that's being played out. They've been working on this for about 30 years now mm -hmm. in not only Arizona, but many other states. And they do it by paying the, the campaign costs for politicians, in other words, politicians are on their payroll one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So they have a tremendous influence on what's happening in the legislation in, in, in states such as Arizona, yes. and their agenda is private education. Yes. How are we gonna combat the Koch brothers? Because they're outside of the political system and they're having so much influence, uh, as, you've, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Have you any thoughts about how to deal with that problem? I mean, the only thing we can do is elect people who don't take the money from them. I mean, that's really our only power right now because they're also paying for curriculum. They're paying for university curriculum. They're paying, they have curriculum in the Tucson Unified School District. You know, their brand of economics, they're paying districts to use their textbooks. I mean, they're spending the most money right now to influence curriculum. Um, so it's hard, you know, and their, it, their goal isn't just to privatize education, it's to privatize it for wealthy white Christian children. You know, if the first time you hear the word school choice, if you do some research, it's about 10 months after Brown versus Board of Education. Yeah. So school choice originally started as a way to get around desegregation laws. Yeah. Now granted, that's not the way it is everywhere today. There are charter schools, you know, experimental doing other things, but that's how it started and that's kind of where it goes. But, you know, there are candidates right now running in our legislature who are very clear that they do not support that agenda and that's just getting the word out, educating people. I don't know. It seems almost like an impossible task, right? But We'll do what we can. They, these, this information, I think, facts helps again because they're good at what they do. You know, they're good at convincing people that a private education is best. The money follows the kid, and free market competition makes schools better. Kids aren't dollar signs. You know, we're not producing a good or a, you know a product. I think it's just showing why it's such a foundation of our democracy. Founding fathers wrote extensively about why a public education system is so important. You have good public, even if you want to send your kid to a parochial school. When your neighborhood school is well-funded and well-performing, your property values are higher, the citizens around there are healthier, there's less crime, there's better economy. So just teaching that maybe from a different perspective maybe gives people pause, hopefully. <laughs> um, okay, so a uh, follow-up. Um, so you mentioned 
uh, red thread and also the, the renewal of Prop 301, which mm -hmm. seems to be more smoke and mirrors than actually effective. So I guess, and we talked about the ideal, where we would kind of like to be and all the ways that we're not there. Do you have any good news for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think, I mean, even in the last, I've only been like involved in education advocacy for the last couple of years. I mean, I I was a public school teacher before I had my kids. My husband was a public school teacher. His father, his grandfather, he's a third generation teacher, my husband. Every one of my friends is a teacher. Even in the last two years, I would say just the awareness and the motivation to change things has just exploded, right? I mean, we are the reddest of red states. We had the largest teacher walkout in the entire nation. Um, you know, the largest demonstration in state history was to do with this, right? I mean, amazing. Getting national attention. I was working with um, a reporter for the New York Times Magazine. She came in and did this massive article, if you um, haven't read it, it's by Dale Russikoff, about Arizona. And I asked her, I'm like, why did you come here? You know, they did walkouts in West Virginia. They started it, Oklahoma, you know, what is, and she said, the entire nation is just looking at you guys like, this is where it happened? Like, everyone was so blown away that she's like, I just really need to know why and what's happening. And I mean, I think the amount of teachers I have met who are like, I voted just straight Republican my whole life or straight this, and I never paid attention, now I know. And they're out there every weekend canvassing and doing stuff. I mean, that gives me a lot of hope that things will change. And again, we're not going to change overnight. It took us 20 years to get here. I told you that it's going to take 15 years, even if we end every tax exemption, to get to where we need to be. It's a long fight, and I think that's, it's hard for some people to know that, you know, we just can't ever go to sleep again. We have to keep talking about this every year and make sure it never happens again, but I'm hopeful, for sure. Okay, anybody else? Boy. Okay, thank you again. Thank Another you. round of applause for Sarah. <laughs> so, we have a tradition here at the Humanist Society to mug our speakers. So consider this your first mug, and I hope that you can come back again sometime. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. All right, thank you. Chris will close up. Don't forget that Sarah's joining us for lunch, too. I can be a little bit more opinionated out there, so ask me all the tough questions. All righty. Well, I hope we do see you at lunch. Um, join us next time on the 23rd. We get to vote on the professionalization question. Plus, we have Charlotte's shirt, uh, shirts. Uh, what you should know about the current global refugee crisis. That's going to be our next event. Uh, this was streamed live on YouTube. You can be a, uh, become a Patreon, support us long term. Uh, just search for Human Society of Greater Phoenix on YouTube if you want to check this out again, uh, rewatch it, leave some comments. Um, we could use some help with the tablecloths.